Hi, welcome to the Catholic Corner. I'm Monsignor Walter Nolan, and today we're on location at St. Paul's Church in Princeton, New Jersey. You know, there's so many times that uh, people come into our lives that really impress us, influence us, and transform our lives. Today we're so, so blessed to have a wonderful, wonderful man, priest, human, wonderful person who's going to be with us and talk to us about some male spirituality and maybe some other topics. It's Father Richard Rohr. Father Richard's a Franciscan priest of the New Mexico province. He founded the Jerusalem community in Cincinnati in 1971 and the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1986, where he presently serves as uh, founding director. Father Richard, many of you know from his books or D, uh, talks and things that he does, uh, CDs, DVDs. I know in the year of St. Paul that we had a little while back and we did some programs on, I took a lot of his work and a lot of his uh, uh, readings and his, his, uh, DVDs and kind of influenced my own spirituality, my own life. So we're very, very happy today to have Father Richard Raw, and he'll spend some time with us on one of his latest books, On the Threshold of Transformation, Daily Meditations for Men. Father Richard, God bless you. Thanks for coming with us today. I know you're a busy, busy man and a wonderful man, and uh, uh, it was a delight to have you in our parish recently, you know, when you gave some talks for us, and I know places around New Jersey. So um, could I just ask you just a little bit to kind of get us going here? The Center for Action and Contemplation out in Albuquerque, which is a marvelous, marvelous place. Yeah, we're lucky to be there. Uh, I founded the center 24 years ago as a place to give people who are working for social change some kind of in-depth spirituality so they could do this work, but do it from a good place, a positive place. And we've been gone 24 years. Uh, we run conferences and internships and little publication and uh, it's a good place to be, and it's a good work to do. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're yeah, welcome. And, yeah. and certainly uh, New Mexico is a, is, yeah. a, is a place of God. When you go there, you just kind of can feel his it's, presence in so many different ways. It's really true. I know you have so many, uh, you know, just from knowing you so well, so many thoughts, topics, you know, of your own spirituality and how you, you share that with so many people. But I thought it would be nice, you know, uh, uh, for our own maleness and for a lot of the men, uh, you know, we, we sometimes, I think, uh, forget that there's a distinctiveness to, to our own uh, blessings and gifts of God and that wonderful work of yours on the threshold of transformation. Um, can you tell us a little bit, uh, you know, why did you write it? Uh, what's it for and uh, what do you hope to get out of it? Well, to be honest, I didn't write it. Two wonderful men uh, looked through my 20-some years of CDs and talks and conferences and books on the subject of male spirituality. And they were kind enough, at great cost to themselves, to read all this stuff. And they put together what they thought were my 300-some best uh, little statements. And uh, they gave it the title, too, On the Threshold of Transformation. You know, people think the author uh, chooses the title. Usually we don't. And someone else who can get some distance and some overview, they'll often see something that you yourself can't see. So they thought that more often than not, in these 366 meditations, I was talking about how people change, how grace works, how, how God grows us up. So they gave it that title, and I, I hope it achieves some of that purpose. Well, the title itself kind of draws you in, I think. Uh, uh, I don't know if we're resistant to change, I, and I'm talking from a male viewpoint. Sometimes it's kind of like, oh, well, we, we got it, you know? Yes, and uh, yes. I know a few times in my life, I even think back when I was younger and thought, you know, oh boy, <laughs> you know, do I really have it now? I don't need and then it. to look back and say, oh my God, <laughs> you know? But the, the, the whole notion of transformation, uh, speak about that a little bit. It's just a, a, a marvelous word that kind of does draw you yeah. out. You know, a lot of us have started using the word because I'm afraid the word conversion took on such a narrow meaning in many people's minds. We're approximately talking about the same thing, but we're not talking about joining a group or uh, accepting some new principles in our head. We're talking about being a different kind of person, that, that you're really changed in a substantial way at the core. And I think for a lot of us, the word transformation, which is a biblical word, it just usually was translated with different words, 
uh, comes closer to that. So I like it myself, and I use it a lot. Does that uh, have the same meaning as that Greek word metanoia, or is it even something a little beyond that? Well, it includes it, would probably be bigger, but thank you for centering in on that. As you probably know, the word metanoia literally means to go beyond your mind or to change your mind. And you mentioned before how really human beings do not like to change. We don't. It's, it's the nature of the ego to achieve some kind of uh, comfort level and you just stay right there. And yet we both know that the first recorded sermon of Jesus, is the first word out of his mouth is uh, translated repent. Uh, but literally it means change, you know. And once you accept a program of willingness to change, those people never stop growing. They just, you know, they just keep becoming more and more and more. But if you don't put change in your life program, normally all of us settle down to an early comfort zone, which sort of affirms our own temperament and personality. And unfortunately, we stop growing. And yet when we go back and think of our lives, the change in our lives, I mean, none of us, it, it, yeah. was, I was a happy kid, mm -hmm. but I don't think I'd want to still be in grammar school. You know, yeah. I was a happy college. I don't, you, you know, once you, once you yeah. feel that and live it, you say to yourself, oh my gosh, it, I, I use the word wow. You, know, wow. you get those wow experiences yeah. that you keep wanting to looking for another wow experience, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, I think you're right that if you just look at your own life, honestly, change is finally forced upon us. But uh, I guess you can do it consciously, willingly, lovingly, with intentionality and, and awareness, or you can just be pushed or shoved or dragged, kicking and screaming. And, and that, I think, is what closes down the personality. When, when you're always resisting, re when your first response to the moment is resistance, I don't think we become uh, the human beings we're meant to be, well, put it I that think, way. I think, uh, Richard, then we go in the corner and kind of cry and say, poor me. Yeah, you I'm you know, so. that, that's, that's the other I'm side of it, so. I think. You know? It's the victim mentality yeah. that, yeah, I'm a victim yeah. of all these circumstances instead of these opportunities to see something new, to become something more. We miss all that. Yeah. And what a shame. It is. Tell us a, a little bit about um, a different approach to men and our spirituality. I, I, I know we, we don't make these mm -hmm. dichotomies, you know, of male, yes, female yes. all the time. But yes. tell me a little bit about your feelings and, and your, 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 your sharing with lots of men in your own, in your own uh, wisdom. Well, let me start by pointing out that uh, women have, have recognized that they need a, sometimes their own vocabulary, their own symbols, their own stories, their own anecdotes. We even speak of uh, women's movies and women's shows and women's novels, but for some reason men haven't recognized that that's true of them too. That there, there's a, a vocabulary, a kind of imagery uh, that turns us on, that awakens us, that interests us. And that's all I've tried to do in these years of working with male spirituality. What is it that makes sense to the soul of a man? What is it that intrigues a man? Now, on a deeper level, I, I think our journeys are approximately the same. We all have to get out of ourself and move toward life, love, and God. But uh, the things that get us there, there's different hooks. Maybe that's the word to use. <laughs> and the, the hook that hooks a woman and attracts and opens her soul and her eyes is usually different. In a way, what I've found in, in our men's rites of passage, these uh, male initiation rites we've given in a number of countries now, uh, if it's a little more raw and honest, and not that women's aren't honest, but it's almost got to be brutal and hard-hitting and clear and clean uh, for men to take it seriously. If it's too pretty, if it's too uh, dressed up or uh, disguised, 
for some reason, the male doesn't take it seriously. Well, that's the hunter, I guess. I, well, I that's know, good. That's, that's very good. Yeah, 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 that's good. But when you said what mm -hmm. intrigues the male, I, 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 in my mind, I kept saying the women. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the male. You know, that, that's the initial resistance to even coming to a men's retreat because mm -hmm. there aren't women there, you know. Right. But uh, the amazing thing is when they get over their initial resistance again, they recognize there's a whole level of feeling, of relating, of connecting that is possible in this setting that's new and that's good. If you can get beyond the usual, you know, superficial level of conversation, which, which we all know we men fall into, sort of talking about sports and the weather and nothing of consequence. But if you can get them a little deeper, there's a kind of safety we've found uh, not that men feel unsafe with women, but a different kind of safety that men feel with other men, uh, just as women feel with other women. Same thing. Uh, you know, I, I, my experience mostly is where I grew up and, and those things, but yet I can understand how, you know, you're almost taught as a young boy grown into manhood that you don't express your feelings, you know, don't cry, and, don't, and you say to yourself, you know, yes. why, why can't we express yes. that in, in, a, in a beautiful way, and, and, uh, uh, which I think which is transforming. And it is, it is fine to be able to say that we can have a gentleness. And just look at the Christ. There I we mean, go. There's, yeah. there's, there's, there's yeah. nobody more gentle. Yeah. Tell me, uh, uh, how, do you, how, do you help, how do these meditations help men to kind of navigate their path, navigate their, their compass, so to speak? Well, uh, the nice thing about meditations is, first of all, they're short. <laughs> and we have found, even the publishers know, men don't tend to pick up long books with long chapters. So we give them little short readings, and they can almost open them up anywhere. And if it speaks to you, which I hope it does, maybe you'll open it the next day and the following day. But uh, they're really covering all the different themes of male spirituality. So my hope is... If one uh, doesn't meet your personal experience, uh, the next day will. And that's the advantage of meditations, that I hope it names something that men have already experienced. And it doesn't feel like I'm coming from nowhere or from some superior level or some clerical priest level. But I, I try, I'm trying to talk on the, the man level, where we're all equals and we're all experiencing the same things. I thought you were talking directly to me, uh, mm -hmm. Father Rich, when you said, uh, you know, men don't like these big books. There are times I, I look at a book and say, oh, 425 pages. Oh, well, I can't do it. <laughs> well, we'll put that aside. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in what ways uh, <coughs> do you urge men to change? In other words, uh, you know, what, what do you urge them to do and to, mm -hmm. where do they start, so to speak? You know, it's going to sound maybe almost too simple or oversimplified. But a line I love to use that I learned from a woman, Paula D'Arcy, she said, God comes to us disguised as our life. <laughs> and I don't think we were told that, really. We thought God came to us through, and not that God doesn't, but through sacraments, through Bibles, through priests, through church services, and that's all true. But if we miss the first seeing that the, the normal raw material that converts you, that transforms you, are the daily events and how you learn to react to them, to respond to them. And, as you know, they almost always demand that we readjust, recalibrate ourselves. <laughs> Why is that turning me off? Why is that making me afraid? And you mentioned that we men aren't sometimes as good at assessing our feelings or expressing our feelings. And that's very true that a lot of men don't even know they're afraid or don't know they're angry. They just give the knee-jerk reaction. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you've got to help them do is experience their own experiences, experience their own body and their own feelings in a deeper way so they start to know what's really happening. I, I noticed one time in the uh, uh, <coughs> talking about sport pages where some of the men, including myself, you, you gravitate to sometimes. There was a poem uh, by a coach. Uh, it wasn't by him, but he, he read it to his players. 
I was called something like the, the man in the glass. Oh, yeah. And when you were talking, it was really to say, look at the man in the glass, and that's you, and reflect on, how, on the goodness there and the, and the gifts that are there, et cetera, et cetera, you know, which I think is what I'm hearing you say a little bit. I hope so. You know? I, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, until we, we are part of the storyline, we don't take the storyline seriously. If you even talk about Jesus, God, it's an interesting external reflection. But somehow when you know that your very identity, your very experience is caught up with the mystery of God, that you're a part of whatever is happening and your part matters, then we're all invested. <laughs> I, once all, said, I once said to some folks, uh, what's the greatest gift God ever gave you? And he looked at me, and I said, "I think the greatest gift God ever gave you is you." Wow, that's you know, lovely. and that's uh, yeah. that's uh, tell me uh, in in, uh, in the forward of your book, mm -hmm. uh, Joe Durapos writes uh, that these meditations should not be looked at as daily devotional, mm -hmm. but as daily confrontational. I love that. <laughs> Wasn't that clever on his part? Yeah, <laughs> Joe is one of the two men who spent a whole year wow. researching all my material, and he came up with that beautiful introduction to the book. And uh, I thought that was clever of him to say that a lot of them probably aren't soft passages. Uh, they, they push you a little or they ask a bit of you. And that goes along with what I was saying at the beginning, that I think men respect things if they're a little more hard, a little more clear, clean, confrontational, with some truth, not in an angry way, not in a pushy way, but just the, the self-evident nature of truth. So I hope they are confronts as much as uh, devotions. See, uh, we men understand that uh, no pain, no gain, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, that there's got to be some, some, some sweat given and some, some thought given and some, yeah. some time given. Joe also said in the, in, in the book, uh, plead with us not to pass on our pain or inflicted on others, but rather to listen and learn from it. You know, mm -hmm. when I heard that, I said to myself, you know, because I've said this and I feel this, some of the greatest people I've ever met in my life were people who have suffered, had some pain. Immensely. And, yeah. and you know, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can understand it or we certainly mm -hmm. don't ever wish that on somebody, no, but no. speak to me a little bit about that. Yeah, it seems that pain is part of the deal. Carl Jung, the psychologist, called, said human life includes some necessary suffering. And I don't know, just as you said, I don't know why it's true. Although we Catholics putting the cross right at the center, the message was pretty clear that Jesus was saying himself, pain is part of the deal and it's all going to be, how do you deal with it? What do you do with it? Because it is going to come your way. And as I say probably too often, if you don't learn how to transform it, uh, it just settles there. <laughs> and by the time you get my age, there is so much un unprocessed hurt, betrayal, abandonment, rejection, disappointment, death, failure, use whatever word you want, but, but it just piles up. And, and what it makes you is, to be honest, is, is unhappy. You know, I just heard last week, uh, this surprised me, but someone, I guess, did the study. Children up to the age of about three or four smile 300 times a day. And people my age, in the late 60s, we smile two and a half times a day. Now, there it is. That, you smile well, more than well, two and a half Well, you do too, but what, what has happened, you know? between the little three-year-old kid, which is why we're attracted to him, this little grin on their face, I guess, puts a grin on our face. But what happens between three and 65 that, that we smile less and less, life becomes a grim paying of debts and repaying debts and counting the cost and counting the hurts. I and guess in our faith, we just don't always look for resurrection, do we? Th that's it's, it. it. It's up there somewhere, yeah, yeah. and it's okay for him. But or it's later. Yeah, it's yeah, all pushed right. off that's till right. later. Yeah. I just heard a little story that, that you reminded me of. A, a, a dad said to me when, when the, he took his little son, about three, four years mm. old, to a, to a basketball game, and, and the, the team, I guess, they're rooting for were losing. And at halftime, the little boy said, Daddy, I'm okay up here. I'm, I'm safe. You could go down and help them win. 
<laughs> oh wow! You know that's that's yeah. that that's that smile, that's uh -huh. that joy, and uh, yeah. or taking the pain and saying, you know, we can we can make this uh -huh. better. Yeah. You know, tell me, uh, 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 one of the, one of the statements in your book: for centuries, males have been encouraged and rewarded for living an outer life of performances, which are usually framed in terms of win or lose. In such a world view, and I just even mentioned it myself. Uh, are there are there only winners and losers and no in betweens or can you speak about that you know win win or you know the win lose scenario uh, which is the the way our civilization is built I mean it's it's really the, the kingdom of this world it's all win lose at every level that's what capitalism means uh, that's what sports means that's what job means that's what school means and the male imbibes that very early and. He likes it for some strange reason. It, it lets him know where he stands. But unfortunately, when you frame reality that way, and I'm convinced when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he's saying there's a different way of framing reality that is win-win. Right? But it, when you framed your whole life in terms of win-lose, the sad thing is most people lose. <laughs> Uh, just take the American Idol phenomenon, which finally at the end, there's one person standing there. <laughs> it's not a good way to frame reality. It really isn't. <laughs> and I think that's what Jesus is saying when he's talking about the kingdom of God. There's a different way to live where you don't have to be competing, comparing, judging, differentiating uh, yourself from other people and always saying, I'm better than you because because that wears out after a while and you run out of reasons why you're better. <laughs> a lot of people just give up early and uh, agree that they're not better or they can't be better, which is of course a lie. But the win-lose scenario, I'm going to say it's, it's the exact opposite of the gospel could, and yet it's commonly held by Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Could, yeah. could we ever look at it this way? Um, that there, there is, I understand win-win, but could there be a win-lose, but that in God's kingdom that we recognize each other's gifts, and even though we do our very best, whatever it is, the fact is, is that we can glory also in the fact that someone else has a, a greater gift, or because another I have gifts gift, too, you know, so that yeah. it's win-lose, but it's win-win at win, the same win, time. Too. You know? No, that's a very good balancing. You know? uh, I, I think that makes sense to me, as you put yeah. it. That okay, I can lose in this area and I don't need to be, I'm not good at that, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. Uh, what my gift is, is over here. And, and by the second half of life, you learn to be content with what you are and accept what you're not. But that's hard, that's hard. for a 16-year-old boy. That, yeah, that's yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's right. Yeah. That's why we have to be transformed. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. The other, another statement in your book that I loved is one of the most surprising but revealing discoveries was that much male anger is actually male sadness. Isn't that something? Yeah. That line always, or that whole concept, I develop it sometimes in talks to men. It immediately has the entire group's attention mm. and women's attention too. I, I just spoke it in New York last week where, uh, you know, you could see the, the women said, oh, this gives me a whole new understanding, sympathy, patience, because I know it's true of my husband. I myself think of him as an angry old man, road rage and all the rest, but I know he's a very sad man. You mentioned early on that the male is not given permission, freedom, even capacity to cry. Even though Jesus said, blessed are those who weep. You know, We are the half of the human race that doesn't know how to do that. When you don't learn to feel your feelings, you stuff them. And a lot of stuffed sadness transmutes and comes out as anger. It's so surprising, especially in men, because we don't know how to feel sadness, admit that we're sad, express sadness. Women can literally cry with one another and hug one another when they're crying. We separate, we go into our private room and just get depressed <laughs> when we're sad. And that depression eventually becomes anger and rage. Yeah, I'm sorry to say it, it's, it's clear to me that that's true. 
Now we have <clears throat> the good news of the Lord. You just mentioned the fact of his own, you know, sermons and uh, and the fact that he himself cried. That's right. Uh, how how can we as church people help? Uh, uh, men to recognize and to transform themselves into the, into the to the glory of God, so to speak, or the, or the fullness of what they were created for. Well, maybe first we have to know that it's possible, <laughs> and that it's in fact the goal. You know, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, one of the fathers of the Eastern Church, he said, "Is it fourth century? I'm not sure. Around the fourth yeah. century, maybe fifth, uh, maybe third. Anyway." doesn't matter. He said, sin is quite simply the refusal to keep growing. <laughs> sin is the refusal to keep growing. So we got to say, first of all, this is the goal. It's the meaning of conversion and repentance. Secondly, uh, I know men have a really bad press right now. <laughs> Uh, some of the national magazines in the last six months, the cover stories has been the state of men, and it has not been flattering. Uh, so this, this very recognition that men are not in a good state, I think should give us a new compassion and recognition that we men have our inner work to do. And, and women won't help us, or our brothers won't help us, if they just keep bashing us or telling us how terrible we are. You don't grow people up by telling them how terrible they are or what failures they are, especially when we men are in the competitive mode to begin with. Then we, we say, okay, I'm losing again. But we can grow with, <laughs> with love and blessings and people That's like it. yourselves. And that, Father yeah, Richard, thank yeah. you so, so very oh. much. Father Richard Rohr, uh, his book on the thre threshold of transformation, daily meditations, if you'd like to, to reach uh, Father, malespirituality.org uh, and other writings, information uh, are available on his website and uh, his blessings and pray with him for us and let's all of us men understand the gift that God has given us. this business, it's easy to feel like the low man on the totem pole. Thanks, son. But I'll let you in on a secret. I'm working on my own movie. Coming through. Yeah, that's right. Just in time for this year's Remish Film Festival. A celebration of faith-inspired short films sponsored by the Catholic Diocese of Trenton. First prize was $500. And there's still time for you to enter your short film. For more information, go to remishfilmfestival.com. Remish Film Festival. See you there. All right, everybody, let's dance.